Hello, BookTube. Recently, New World's November 2022 came to an end after a wonderful, fun month. This was a BookTube event that was created by the Bookish Bryants, designed to celebrate science fiction in its shorter form. Short novels, fewer than 220 or 230 pages, and especially short stories and novellas. The shorter form of science fiction that really gave birth to the genre in the pulps and in the anthologies and magazines that sprang up everywhere. It gave a whole bunch of writers a chance to break out and become known and gather a readership long before anybody really thought of hardcover science fiction releases or science fiction releases hitting the New York Times bestseller list or crossing over into the mainstream long before any of that. New World's November was a really fun event. I did not make as many videos as I thought I was going to, but I, I very much enjoyed watching all of the others. And this morning, one of you sent me an email saying that, that in, a, in perhaps a, a connected matter, say, saying that you'd really like to know about science fiction anthologies. Is there one that you could recommend? Since we're talking about short form science fiction, the natural place to go looking for these things is in anthologies. And there are a million science fiction anthologies. And there always have been. There are a million. Once you start looking for them, once you start paying attention to what you're seeing, you realize that they are absolutely a dime a dozen. There are millions of them out there. So what really distinguishes them? It's an excellent question. I sent back a few recommendations, and I have even more. I thought it would make an excellent starter kit. So that's what we're going to go through today. We're going to go through some great science fiction collections, both of short stories and novellas and also of shorter novels. And when it comes to the question of what makes a great anthology, really, the, the answer comes down to two things, which is the connections of the editor and the vision of the editor. And those two things can work against each other, believe it or not. Some people who were really good science fiction editors of literary journals, so you've got a pulp magazine or the book section of a larger magazine and you want to, f to focus on science fiction and you do and maybe you're really good at keeping the paper flowing and keeping the checks going out and keeping people's egos assuaged and keeping the right kind of balance but when it comes to making a book maybe you're not so good at all at that and of course i'm not putting individual issues of any science fiction periodicals on this list there will be great editors on this list, but not always aligned with the best volumes, and vice versa. It's, uh, it's a weird thing. Some editors knew everybody, absolutely everybody in the industry, and were either a firm presence for those everybody's, telling them, here's what I liked, here's what I didn't like, you have to work to, be, to get my sign of approval. I don't have a, an open slush fund for anybody. And then other editors were very much creatures of the dinner table. They were very much creatures of the cocktail hour. They very much were glad-handing and therefore would often give work to their friends, regardless of how good that work was. Or even worse, an even worse crime for an editor. To give work to your friends and then say that the work is good, regardless of how good you think it is. The further back in time you go in science fiction, the further back you go into the bowels of the, of the golden age, the more you will find that kind of log rolling and back padding, the more you will find that the great editors are just running the latest stuff by guys they know. And there's a chance that that kind of approach will produce a great anthology down the line if they want to do that, but the odds are against it. The only way that, it, that that approach will produce a great anthology is if you're writing, if you're anthologizing simply great authors. And then... Uh, <laughs> Uh, the great Theodore Sturgeon <laughs> will always come up in a discussion like this. And he once upon a time said that 90% of science fiction is crud. But then again, 90% of everything is crud. <laughs> it has become known as Sturgeon's Law. It is absolutely right. And I've encountered it quite a bit. I encountered it quite a bit in New World's November. Especially when, as I mentioned in one of the only videos that I made about the event, when you are dealing with a science fiction story, where actual science has outstripped the science speculation in that story. Whether it's about faster than light travel, or exoplanets, or life on Venus, or life on Mars, once you strip away the science speculation, once the science speculation, if it's not really well done, will be 
there only to titillate your imagination. Wow, could that really be? Could it really be? So if somebody, let's say Robert Heinlein, writes a story about how mankind will get a vessel to the moon, Earth's moon, and the way that he describes is a gigantic, basically a gigantic rubber band strung between two mountaintops, pulled way back like this, and then fired with no chemical engines at all. <laughs> if you read a whole story about the construction of that thing and the way it's going to work and the physics, and you know that not only would it not have worked, but that it didn't work, that that didn't happen, then you are reduced. If the science speculation elements are removed, you're reduced to looking at the fiction. And a lot of these writers were pounding away on a manual typewriter, badly hung over, at the last minute, for $50. So you won't get a lot of good prose. <laughs> so the risk you run with a legendary editor who is of that old school, who knows everybody, who's, yeah, I'll find one for you, oh yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll find something for you, is that they'll publish junk. And I believe with science fiction, the longer time goes on, the easier it is to spot the junk. Uh, and that, when we're talking about that kind of old style, glad hand, know everybody, need a, a floater of $30 to get you through until payday or whatever kind of editor, who's more concerned with the people than with the product, which is inevitable if you know all the people. When we talk about that kind of editor, there are a few names that come up right away. And my first one on the list here is one of those. It's Don Walheim. Don Walheim and his wife. And this is the pocketbook of science fiction. Don Wal Donald Walheim did a long collection of annual year's best science fiction stories. And <laughs> I'm trying to think of a nice way to put this. The less he had to do with the editorial chores of those annual year's best science fiction collections, you'll see them used all the time. The less he had to do with the editorial selection process of those volumes, the better the selection process got. The later volumes in that series are much better in terms of reading them now in the unguessable year 2022. Those of us who were maybe submitting stories to Don Walheim and his wife, those of us who were talking with these figures in a certain back room, a literary back room discussion group, those of us who were reading these things in the periodicals, in fantasy and science fiction, in analog, in omni and whatnot, all of those years, year after year after year, none of us, I assure you, were even remotely imagining that we would be talking about any of this in 2022. <laughs> we did not remotely imagine. I know you'll think, well, what do you mean? If you were so-and-so years old in 1961, surely you thought there was a chance you'd see 2022. I'm here to tell you, no, <laughs> no, none of us thought that. None of us did. <laughs> we are all living just gobsmacked in a future we thought we would never see. Holding up a science fiction device in order to talk to you about science fiction anthologies on another science fiction device. <laughs> these, these early science fiction stories that Donald Walheim anthologized, every once in a while when I would be reading them in whatever pulp magazine I grabbed off the spinner rack at the dry goods store, every once in a while one of those stories would mention a kind of worldwide intelligence network some way that we could exchange stories or messages in real time that girded the whole world in a kind of supranet, as one of these stories called it. <laughs> anyway, uh, those I can't include any of those individual anthologies that he did year by year. They are, some of them, very good. They get better as they go along. This will have to do, it would be impossible to do a science fiction anthology uh, starter kit without Donald Wahan. That would be unthinkable. But he didn't ever really make a, a one volume really towering collection. He was always, he was almost always concerned with keeping the paper flowing. What's the next thing I've got to do? What's the next introduction I've got to bang out? What's the next author that I've got to keep satisfied? What's this he's saying? Well, if I don't get you know, my gas bill paid, then I can't submit anything to you. All right, well, I better pay your gas bill for you, and you'll just owe it to me, or whatnot. If he, he was so deeply involved in that old boy network that he seldom raised his eyes up to make a great standalone anthology. Uh, this is the closest, I think, that he ever came, and this is, of course, like a lot of things I'm going to talk about long since out of print. And when we're talking about... Uh, science fiction anthologies, for readers of a certain age, one particular thing is going to come to mind. And 
it's a confusing thing because it took many forms in many volumes and sub volumes, <laughs> but I had to include it as well. So it's going to be basically as one entry. I think there were a, a grand total of five of these volumes, maybe four. I'm mostly familiar with three. It's the Science Fiction Hall of Fame, uh, edited by Arthur C. Clarke and George Proctor. George Proctor doing the lion's share of the work here. This is volume three. Uh, then we have volume 2A, <laughs> you see what I mean, volume 1, uh, volume 1 is edited by Robert Silverberg, and this is, I think, Robert Silverberg's only appearance on this list, and volume 1, I believe, has been reprinted in a very nice uh, redesign. Uh, maybe they all have, I don't know. These anthologies are very much, the first one, at least, volume 1, is very much still thickly enmeshed in the good old boy network of the golden age or the passing of the golden age. The only difference being Robert Silverberg didn't care how well he knew you. He didn't care about your grocery bill. He didn't care about, you know, you making ends meet for this month. He didn't care about anything except the quality of the work. And boy, oh boy, does it show in these anthologies. You take them back to back. You go back 60 years and ask in, in, at any, you know, embryonic science fiction convention, finish, this sentence, the greatest science fiction editor alive today is everyone at that convention, without any exception, everyone would have said Donald Walheim. No one would have said Robert Silverberg. They might have said he was a really good new author, but they would never call, have credited him with being an editor. He's a really good editor. And these volumes, they were once uh, mass market paperbacks. I think they have been entirely reprinted, but they're worth finding. They are, they're kind of towering when it comes to science fiction collections. Then this next one, these next two, are collections of short novels, which is often worth doing. I don't think it's as often worth doing as a lot of science fiction fans will say. I myself think that the surest way to kill a great science fiction story is to add 100 pages. <laughs> and that is, that is anathema now. Of course, some of you may have seen uh, Liam's Lyceum, uh, just did a video. I'll remember, I'll leave a link to it. I tried to I remember to leave a link to him yesterday, but he did a video recently on uh, bloat in fantasy novels. And bloat is very much present in science fiction novels as well, and uh, it's almost always to the detriment of the book. Almost always. But shorter novels can sometimes work. Sometimes they are drastically uneven, and so you have to you have to be a, a little bit aware of that. Sometimes you'll know in oh I don't know thirty pages. Thirty pages is usually the screaming red limit maximum of how long a science fiction concept can be stretched on the rack. The only thing that will carry it past that is the writing talent of the author. There's no amount of of G wow blow your mind adventure invention that will get you past that thirty page mark. Then it has to be prose. And uh, I don't want to invoke Theodore Sturgeon's law again, but many, many science fiction authors cannot pass that test. You'll notice it even in these next two, but these really are things to own. If you want just a shelf of science fiction that you can delve into over and over again, that you can read and reread, you really want these two. They are box set, two volume sets from the Library of America. Library of America branched into science fiction. Instead of honoring Ursula Le Guin or Ray Bradbury, they decided to do these colorful anthologies of the 1960s, great science fiction novels of the 1950s and the 1960s, both two volumes in slipcases. Uh, and they are really well done. They are really, really well done. I, there is a... You start to think really hard about the logistics facing any editor assembling an anthology like this when you look at these two volumes. I'm not the only science fiction fan, especially of a certain vintage, who looked at the table of contents in these things and thought, why on earth would you include that? Why on earth would you include, I mean, of your best science fiction novels of the 1960s, I can think of 10 science fiction novels in the 1960s that were better than anything uh, in this volume. Some of that will come down to the editor, but a lot of it will come down to copyright and what will fit. I mean, if you did a two-volume set of the best science fiction novels of the 1960s and you wanted one of them to be Dune, well, that's one whole volume. The, the choices here are very, very interesting. They are a little bit uneven, but they are so uh, gamesomely presented that you will go back to those volumes over and over again. I go back to mine all the time. I was, I've gone back to mine so much that 
if I were to see individual volumes or the box sets at the Brattle Bookshop, I would get them even though they're doubles because I'm worried that I'm wearing mine out. The, I'm very rough on my stuff and I'm especially rough on box sets. So <laughs> it's a, I have to be very careful with them. They are, they are wonderful though. Then this next one is a modern editor. He, I say modern, but he's been at it for a long, long time, many, many decades. But he has the, the magic that I'm talking about, the Silverberg magic, where he might know you, he might have helped you out, he might have given you your start, but he's not going to include you in any anthology unless uh, he thinks you deserve it. And even better than that, he comes late enough in the process of science fiction anthologizing so that you can start to take a broader look at things. One of the elements in estimating the worth of a science fiction story or a novel, I hate to say it, but it's true, one of the elements involved is the element of time, the fourth dimension. <laughs> How long does a book work on you? How many questions does it keep asking when you look back on it? That is often a function of the writer's sight, of the writer's foresight. But uh, it's often a thing that will be, it'll go right by you when you're reading it the first time, or even when you're rereading it a year later. It takes time to do that. And this editor came along when science fiction had been producing anthologies and short stories and novels for long enough so that he could start to take a panoramic view of what is important in history, what's really good in the history of the genre. He wrote a few volumes. I think he's one of the only uh, editors that's on this list twice that are indispensable. You just, you just, if you're interested in science fiction short stories, you have to have and read and study these volumes. And the, the editor is David Hartwell. And the first book is The Science Fiction Century. I had this as a trade paperback, and it I, I ripped it apart. I, I read it so many times that it fell apart. I'm just waiting to find it again. This is a great anthology, and not only for its contents. That's, that's yardstick number one for any great anthology is how many good things are there versus how many duds. I don't know how many anthologies Don Wallheim put together. There are so many duds in them. I mean, you can, the story of many of his anthologies will never be told, but it has nothing to do with literature. That story would have only to do with, I met, you know, I met so-and-so at, at a dinner party the other night. She was talking about how down in the dumps her husband was. He really wanted a sale, and he hasn't had one in a while. And You know, I, I make good money, so we don't need it, but it's, it's really bothering him. It's making it impossible to live with. And the, the whole anthology that, we, that you might pick at random from Donald Walheim, it owes its existence to him putting his hand on her arm and saying, oh, I'll, 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 let, me, let me give him a call in the morning. <laughs> There's nothing like that here. This is a historical survey, and it's brilliantly done. It's, it's, Hartwell is leaving behind the era when you had to worry about the old boy network. Once upon a time, that was the besetting worry in science fiction anthology. Could not avoid it. And that almost always destroys the anthology. Right? Because when you make an anthology without literary concerns, you're hurting yourself. You're, you're hurting the anthology. I want to get, I want to see if I have, yes, I have one other David Hartwell. This is, uh, Catherine Kramer also helped to edit this one. This is The Ascent of Wonder. It's really, really terrific. It's also historical overview. And this is the evolution of so-called hard science fiction. Now, I, if you watch this channel, you know I have my issues with hard science fiction. Uh... There are only a couple of science fiction authors, a handful, you could fit them in a room, in the entire history of the genre, who could write scientifically informed science fiction. Most of them couldn't. They could put on a good bluff, but they couldn't do it. Some of them, the, the genre has been blessed with some really good writers who were also scientists, so they could manage it. I mean, usually not. Uh, so I have, I have my suspicions, I've always had my suspicions about what I now know to call the dude bro element of hard SF. It, it makes me suspicious, but this volume is just wonderfully done. Hartwell is such a hands-on presence as an editor. He's not just slapping stories together and putting them in front of you. He's, he's very much curating them and talking about them, introducing them to you. So those two volumes, The Ascent of Wonder and uh, The Science Fiction Century, are indispensable. In my opinion, they're indispensable. Hartwell also has done many, many year, years that year's science fiction anthologies, and a couple of other big anthologies that are well worth your time. His name as an editor on a book is just in general well worth your time. We're going to find a couple of other names like that on this list, like this one. Uh, when you think science fiction anthology series year by year, if you're not a science fiction fan of a certain vintage, if you came to the genre, let's say, in the 90s or later, 
then you're going to think of a name, and it's not going to be any of the names that old-timers have. Donald Walheim's not going to come up with you, nor any of the other names I'm thinking of. You're going to think of Gardner Dozwell, who, for 35 years, did a big, generous, wonderful volume of the year's best science fiction. And they were great. Dozwell also edited hundreds of other things, and he is one of those figures where if, he's, if he is the editor of a volume, probably it's going to be really good. It's worth a bet, definitely, especially if it's a used paperback for a dollar. But he did, from the grind that I mentioned, from the, the process of keeping the paper flowing, he did look up at one point, whether he had a premonition of the end or whether he thought, you know, I need, I need both arms to get myself out of a chair in the morning or <laughs> I didn't use to do that. Whatever the reason was, he decided to make a big anthology drawing from the yearly anthologies that he did. And it is fantastic. It's this. It's the very best of the best. 35 years of the best science fiction, and I, of course, have my issues with, I would have my issues with any pick that he might do, but this is a fantastic volume. There's barely an entry in here that it, that has any of the feeling of being chosen by momentum or assumption, where you're, you're putting a book together like this. I would certainly do it this way. I'm completely vulnerable. I would not make a good editor in the way that he was. You're putting a volume together like this, and you think, oh, i got to have this. No, I gotta have that. No, no, no. This this doesn't have any feeling of that at all. It has the feeling of everything having been rigorously re-examined. As a capstone to Dozois' year's best science fiction that came out every year, this is uh, terrific. It's fittingly monumental. Then I mentioned that if you are if you're a certain if you're a local youth, <laughs> if you're a certain youth, you will think of Dozois as when the sentence comes up, science fiction editor. Once upon a time, it wouldn't have been him that you would have been, that you would have thought of. Once upon a time, it would almost certainly have been this figure, Terry Carr. This is the year's best, the best science fiction of the year, number one, and we have a list: Poole Anderson, Lloyd Bigel, Arthur Clarke, George Effinger, Philip Jose Farmer, Ursula Le Guin, Larry Niven. Uh, Terry Carr knew everybody, but he was very much in the silver, what we'll call the Silverberg school of editing, where it, he had to he had to like the story; it had to be really good. He had to think it was, uh, the, the term we used at Open Letters Monthly, anthologizable. He had to think it was that good or he wouldn't put it in no matter what. No matter how much he liked you, no matter how much you were hoping you would be in the year's best. This was the first volume. He did 15 or 16 of these. And I'm not singling this one out. Every one of these volumes, unlike Don Walheim's yearly, the yearly vo volumes, every one of these volumes is worth getting, finding, and reading and rereading. They're amazing anthologies mainly because of the vision and, ca and talent of the editor. What I'd really like here, though, this is meant as a stand-in for what I'd really like. Of course, it would be a copyright nightmare. It will never it will never happen. But what I would really like would be a big volume of those 15 years' best science fiction, edited by Terry Carr. You wouldn't, you wouldn't need a new introduction. Pick the best introduction from, all, from any one of these volumes, or any general introduction that he did, or maybe get some new anthologizer to reflect on Terry Carr. Everybody liked him. Somebody would write an introduction to this that would be really good. Get all of those volumes together. They were all very thin. And make them one volume. Put them together in one volume. It would be about the size of the Walheim Best of the Best. And have it be Terry Carr Science Fiction or something like that. Seems It seems almost incumbent in a, in a starter kit like this that at least once I will call for a book that does not exist. <laughs> but it gives me a chance to recommend any one of these individual volumes. If you see them in a used bookstore, snap them up. If you see them in a used bookstore and you don't know anything about science fiction anthologies and you're thinking a lot of lines of how I opened this video, I don't really know what I'm getting. Is this a whole bunch of score settling or, uh, you know, uh, fan appeasing or whatnot? I don't know the, I don't know the editorial vision of the editor, so I don't know if this is worth it to get. Terry Carr is very much worth it to get. He is a, very much a name where if you see his name as an editor of a volume, he did best science fiction. He did a series called Universe that was the same thing as this, collecting a bunch of stories that came out that year. He did best fantasy. I think he did the best horror series as well that were shorter lived. If you see any of these things, especially the science fiction volumes, grab them. You'll be glad you did. They are wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. And then we, I mentioned that if you'd gone back 60 years to a science fiction convention and said the best living science fiction editor is, I said that everybody would say Don Walheim. 
and maybe they would have. I think they would have. But there's another name that was even bigger. Towered, it towers even now over the whole of the genre. Uh, and has come in for a great deal of abrobrium by people who should be grateful, <laughs> as usual in the 21st century. The, the abrobrium will come from people who should be grateful instead of heaping you with dirt. An unsavory figure, definitely, but nevertheless, a towering figure as a science fiction editor, and that is John W. Campbell. Now, he would put his editorial name on a huge number of books, and he often didn't pay attention, and he often had grudges to settle, and he often had private favors to repay. He is not along the lines of David Hartwell or Gardner Tozwa or Terry Carr. He is not the kind of editorial name where if you see his name on an anthology, you can trust it, <laughs> unfortunately. I don't think he would like that, but you can't. It, he he has his name on many dozens of anthologies that are crap, or that are mostly crap. So I, it was it was tough to pick one of his, but he had to be on this list. I picked the Astounding Science Fiction Anthology. He was the poobah of Astounding for a long, long time. This has very classic authors. For the most part, this is a, a, a table of contents that you really can't refuse. You really can't look at the table of contents and, and think, well, this is dated, or these names didn't last. There are really good choices here, including a, a very strong story by Lester Del Rey, who is another name that you would expect is on this list as an editor. He's not. But you'd, you'd think it. I, was, I, was, I came close, but I didn't want this list to be 50 things long. But you have to include John W. Campbell. And I don't know how, how findable this is. A lot of the stories that are included in here, the Asimov, the A.E. Van Vogt, there are stories that are much anthologized elsewhere. But this is still worth finding. If you can find a $2 copy of this used, it's definitely worth it. It is, it is another example of, of a, a slightly compromised editorial vision. Campbell obviously had an editorial vision. His editorial vision, I would argue, gave rise to science fiction in the form that we knew it for, for 50 or 60 years. It has largely changed form now. It has become the, the piñata of Twitter politics now. But once upon a time, for a long time, that, that vision of the best writing that we can get, not all that much of a wordsmith, but can we maybe punch this up a little, plus the best science speculation that we can get. No more bug-eyed monsters. Married in the fiction. That vision was John W. Campbell's, and that largely helped to, to raise the genre of science fiction a lot. To raise it out of the primordial ooze that it had been living in for a long time. I think that without Campbell, science fiction might have died as, as a genre. I'm not supposed to praise him. I'm not actually praising him, the person. I'm, the person was fairly odious. I'm praising the, the work. Good luck doing that in the 21st century. But but uh, on the opposite end of the spectrum from someone like Campbell or even Donald Walheim, I hate to say it because you've never met a nicer guy, but on the opposite side of the spectrum from that kind of editorial vision that you could suspect of being in the know, certainly very well connected, but also compromised. Why are these stories in here? Does it have anything to do with their merit? Does it always have only to do with their merit? They're not going to pass that test. They aren't. Silverberg will, almost always. Hartwell will, always. And this next anthology, absolutely. Absolutely it will. One of the best modern science fiction anthologies that I have ever encountered. Really, if you are a science fiction fan or you're hoping to become one, you got to have this volume on your shelf. And the nice thing is, unlike a lot of the things on this list, you can go to your local Barnes & Noble or Books A Million and simply buy a copy of it. <laughs> uh, it's the big book of science fiction, edited by Anne and Jeff Vandermeer. Big floppy thing, double columns to read in. Wonderful, wonderful choices here. Just, this this epitomizes for me the element that I was talking about of the fourth dimension, the, the element of time, because this really improves in your mind the more you think on it, the longer you deal with it, the longer you live with it and go back to it. And that is a product of editorial vision. That's an editor saying, this I might like, but this should be in here. And that's a quality that you can't bottle. You never can tell when it, uh, someone gets to the rank of a commissioning editor whether or not they're going to have that. Plenty of them get to that rank and don't. 
these two do. And this volume, I think, is going to be a classic as time goes on. Along the lines of all the other classics on this list, I think it's the most common, the most recent one uh, on this list. Then, this, <laughs> this next one, there's a trouble that you run into with anthologies of any kind, and that is to let the inmates run the asylum. <laughs> you will always run into trouble when you do that. There are obvious benefits to doing that. The inmates tend to know where the bodies are buried. They, the specialists in a field will tend to know everything that's out there. They were almost always rabid fans before they started writing themselves. That's what makes, for instance, Robert Silverberg's vision so effective, is that he was a big fan before he started ever dreaming about pulling a volume together of other people's work. So he knew everything that was out there. He knew what had been working on him for a long time. In other words, what had captured that element of the fourth of time. And that's all a strength, definitely. To have a writer edit a volume is always a strength. But there are weaknesses as well. You don't get to be a writer, especially a practice writer, let alone an insanely prolific writer, without having really solid opinions about what you like and don't like, in terms of prose on the page. So where Anne and Jeff Vandermeer might look at a whole range of things and say, well, this is stylistically different from that, isn't it? But how good is it? A very ingrained writer will look and say, well, it's a style I don't like, so it's not getting in my anthology. <laughs> That's a disservice to readers, but writers don't really care. They're not, if they don't have the editorial feedback on, they're not really going to care about the readers. They'll say they will. But they really care about, about propagating their own vision, not of the shape of a genre, but of how it should be done. And it's always the way they do it. <laughs> Uh, that, that can be a problem. The, um, the other endemic problem of having a, a, a writer edit an anthology of short stories is that they are putting a work for sale out in the market. It's a perfect opportunity to help the careers of friends and hurt the careers of enemies. Show me a writer who's made of stern enough stuff to ignore that adaptation. There are very few who are. So with all of those caveats in mind, the next one is a classic anthology that you really should try to find and have in your collection, but it's edited by a writer. You have to keep that in mind. And this is Isaac Asimov, of course. He put his name in big, bright lights. It's really Martin Greenberg that did most of the editing here, but Asimov had the final say, and he also had the say in saying, well, I don't care what else you're adding, but you got to have these 30 stories in there. And this is 100 great science fiction short stories. I don't remember who this... This uh, is just a picture I got off the internet, so it has a library sticker on it. I don't remember... Uh, when this particular cover came out, I'm assuming in the early 90s, just by the look of it, but it had it had a, a wide print history. You could find copies of this used. And there's a lot in here, including, because of the sheer number in the table of contents, a number of authors who don't usually get anthologized and who have fallen by the wayside. One of the joys of anthologies of any kind is that you might find one of those writers and really like them. Right? If you've got a, a, a shorter anthology that has only the big names, well, you'll know, you'll learn from reading that anthology and anthologies like it, which of those big names you really like. But what about the little names? A big, a big, generous collection like this helps a lot with that. Uh, so, and you really couldn't, it really couldn't leave Asimov off the list, I, I, as much as I might want to. Uh, but we're going on long here, so we'll we'll finish up with. Uh, a rare exception, <laughs> an exception where uh, a writer edits an anthology and the anthology turns out to be a classic for one reason or another, against all odds. <laughs> this particular writer was obnoxious and disliked, uh, an obnoxious, smelly little punk. <laughs> In the aforementioned informal writer's coffee clatch kind of conversation in a, in a used bookstore back room. I had the, the honor of being there every day. This particular person is the only person in 31 years who was ever asked to leave. <laughs> no one was asked to leave. We had, we had people in that, that group had people espousing the most horrible, noxious views in the world, but they were still writers. They were still readers. They still browsed the bookshop. They weren't trying to be obnoxious. Uh, of course, you by an introduction like that, you know that I'm talking about Harlan Ellison. And the book I'm talking about is perhaps the most successful science fiction anthology of all time, and that is Dangerous Visions. 
which has an introduction by Asimov that is very much back padding old boy network, and an, a longer introduction by a a Ellison himself that is very much back padding old boy network. And this thing should be all old boy network. You needed to, to you needed to pass muster on Ellison's particular brand of macho detector to even have a chance of being included in this volume. He was paying, and he paid well for the time and for an anthology like this. It was an, a novel concept that he was trying to pull together here, and it worked. It worked. It could have been a gigantic millstone around his neck. The only way that it would vindicate itself as a project is if it worked commercially, and it did. Add to that the fact that it has been one of the most honored science fiction anthologies in the decades since, and there's no way around it. When Harlan was right, Harlan was right. That stings even now <laughs> to say, but nevertheless, this is, uh, it isn't at all the thoroughly revolutionary, you've never seen anything like this before collection that Ellison trumpeted it as and kept calling it even when he, he was making Dangerous Visions 2 and 3 and 4. It isn't nearly as groundbreaking as he thinks, but it is unbelievably strong. Somehow, in the midst of all that glad handing and back patting, all that old boy network, all that, you're, you know, I, I met him at a, at a convention when, you know, he had a good firm handshake or crapola like that, all that kind of stupid crapola that always reaches its fever pitch with men who are very short, <laughs> all of that stuff. Somehow, despite all of those elements at play, Har Harlan Ellison also had that Silverberg touch probably because he learned it from Silverberg, of somehow putting all of that aside in order to judge the merits of the work. It's usually successful. In this volume, it's usually successful. This is a... Uh, anthologies, of course, are not meant to be read serially. You're, they're not books in the sense of a constructed plot. You're not supposed to start at the beginning, read them right through, and get the same emotional highs and lows that you get in a novel that is allegedly constructed along those lines. But nevertheless, if you're putting an anthology together, you kind of want to start with a, on a really strong foot and end on a really strong foot. The, the Dozois volume, the best of the best, does that. Most of the volumes here have at least a stab at it. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what's going on here. Holland Ellison not only starts with those two unbelievably, masturbatorily self-congratulating introductions, one by Asimov and one by himself, but he also starts off the whole anthology with the weakest story in it. <laughs> really, really kind of weird. If you were just, you know, John or Joan Q. Public and you picked this thing up, you know, at a, at a counter in Scarsdale, I thought, oh, what's this? I, I, my kid's really into the science fiction. I'm going to give this a try. I'll skip the introductions, because who cares about that? Let's just read the first story. And then you read the first story. If, if, you, if you didn't have a sense of how anthologies go and how you really have to let them breathe, you really have to you know, jump all around in them. If you thought, well, the, the first story is going to be the best story, or at least the first story is going to be as good as all the other stories, you'd stop. <laughs> That's my first one. Uh, but somehow it works, despite all of that, despite the, one of the worst openings of any anthology on this list. It still works. Now, Dangerous Visions, the first one anyway, Volume 1, uh, is available in the Science Fiction Masterwork series. So there's a there's an ebook, there's a paperback, that, there's really nice cover design, really, really good, solid binding if you get the paperback. So this at least is available, and I'm, unlike some of the other items on this list. And it is as with other items on this list, sort of indispensable. When you think science fiction anthology, if, if you talk to somebody who knows the genre, one of the first things they'll say is Dangerous Visions. At least the first one. Uh, it's not meant to be a survey of the field, it, but it is meant to show really good, thought-provoking, sort of genre, paradigm-bending stories. And it mostly does that. So, so there you go. There's a list of science fiction collections and anthologies. If you made a shelf of these volumes, excerpting only Terry Carr, who does not have a big volume that I wish that I could recommend. Uh, I wish that he did. I wish that that existed. Terry Carr's science fiction, which had 15 chapters, each chapter of which was one of his year's best science fiction volumes. That would be great. I don't think that could ever be done. But... Uh, some of these in these standalone volumes, the Hartwell volumes, the Dozois volume, uh, the Anne and Jeff Vandermeer volume, 
those some of those individual volumes well worth having on your shelf the library of america box sets well worth having on your shelf and and revisiting and those whole series all of gardner dozois 35 volumes all of terry carr's volumes in universe or in uh, best science fiction of the year those are worth having those volumes are worth finding if you find them the individual volumes go by the editor the editor in there you can't go wrong uh, but anyway this has gone on long enough that's a nice a nice little science fiction starter kit for you to bid goodbye to new world's november until next year <laughs> so i will wrap this up for now i will see you soon thank you booktube